Severed and taken up the road about uh, 25 to 50 yards and buried. He was the monster that everyone feared. Uh, he lost her unconscious and strangled it. What made him live was to kill. Knocked her unconscious. They handcuffed her and put her in the passenger side of the car. I would describe him as being as close to being like the devil as anybody I've ever met. Ted Bundy was one of America's most notorious serial killers. Over a four-year period, he brutally murdered and mutilated 30 women. Uh, I don't think anybody doubts that, uh, that I've done some bad things. Uh, the question is what, of course, and, and how, and, and maybe even most importantly, why. His motives remained a mystery until hours before his execution when he claimed a fatal addiction had fueled his horrific crimes. On January the 23rd, 1989, at Florida State Prison, journalists were being shut out of one of the biggest death row stories of the decade. The serial killer, Ted Bundy, was about to reveal what had driven him to commit some of the worst sex crimes America had ever seen. In five cases, he uh, took the girls' heads off and, and kept them as souvenirs. In one case, he, I believe he bit a nipple off. He was like a, a shark. Uh, just, you know, feeding in a, in a frenzy. He could look into their eyes, he could hear their last gap, and actually breathe their last breath as they exhaled. As journalists competed to get Bundy's final interview, he surprised everybody by agreeing to talk to one man only, Dr. James Dobson, a Christian evangelist who flew in especially for the interview. You really feel that hardcore pornography and the doorway to it, softcore pornography, is doing untold damage to other people and causing other women to be abused and killed the way you did others. Listen, I'm no social scientist and I haven't done a survey. I mean, I, I don't pretend that I know what John Q. Citizen thinks about this. <clears throat> but I've lived in prison for a long time now. And I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit violence just like me. And without exception, every one of them was deeply involved in pornography without question, without exception, deeply influenced and consumed by an addiction to pornography. As Dobson saw it, this interview contained a powerful message, one that was central to the Christian evangelical movement and which fanned the flames of the debate about the role of hardcore pornography in violent sexual crimes. The interview was given to every broadcaster in America on one condition, that they play it unedited from start to finish. But had porn really been responsible for turning a seemingly all-American boy into a monster? He told Dobson what he wanted to hear, that it was hardcore pornography, violent, hardcore pornography that led him astray. And that's something that I will not allow my industry to take the blame for. I knew what he said was true. Common sense tells you that that type of hardcore material is destructive for young people especially, and it breeds disrespect and violence against women. The interview started a debate that led all the way to the White House and an investigation into what drove Bundy that would open a chamber of horrors. He wanted to possess them as if he would possess a Porsche or a potted plant. He was basically reconstructing who they physically were. On the eve of serial killer Ted Bundy's execution, crowds gathered outside Florida State Prison determined to see justice done to one of America's worst murderers. 
To comprehend all this, you have to go back a few years to try to understand Ted Bundy, what he did, and who he was. I think Ted Bundy in the United States probably is the standard by which other serial killers are judged. In a four-year period, Bundy committed a series of vicious killings that horrified the public. Beginning with Linda Ann Healy in January of 1974, Bundy began killing approximately one girl a month. In fact, later on, the police would produce what they called the Girl of the Month Club as they traced the, the girls who disappeared and then were later found dead. When police finally arrested Bundy, America was shocked. He appeared to have it all. He was good looking, articulate, a law student and a budding Republican. But he also had a fatal addiction to pornography. Once you become addicted to it, and I look at this as a kind of addiction, uh, like other kinds of addiction, of addiction, you keep, I would keep looking for more potent, more explicit, more it's graphic aggressive. kinds of material. Like an addiction, you keep craving something which is harder, harder, something which, which gives you a greater uh, sense of, of, of excitement. But had this addiction made him a killer? This controversial interview divided public opinion on the role of pornography in sex crimes. It was an extraordinary meeting between a violent serial killer and a Christian evangelist that had been brought about when God sent a message to a lawyer and his wife. Uh, we were watching the evening news and they uh, showed us a picture of Ted Bundy and she looked at me and, and said, John, the Lord just told me that you're going to have a dramatic influence over his life. With Christ's assignment in mind, John and Marsha Tanner became regular visitors to Bundy on death row. There was another issue that Ted eventually revealed, and that was the role that hardcore pornography had played in, in uh, diverting his path to the one that he ultimately took. What happened with adult entertainment between 79 and 89, it became prolific. It became videotaped. It became accessible beyond people's wildest dreams. It moved out of the theaters and into the home. The Tanner's visits coincided with a sea change in attitudes to pornography. So when Ted Bundy said he had a message he wanted to be heard, they knew just who to approach. James Dobson was a Christian evangelist and a member of the powerful Mies Commission that had investigated the links between pornography and crime and was vehemently anti-porn. A repentant serial killer, especially one as photogenic as Bundy, must have seemed like divine intervention. I told him that I thought we could trust Dobson to, to not uh, glamorize or, or pervert or, or sensationalize what he had to say, but would probably take his words and let him just tell his story. The interview was arranged for the eve of Bundy's execution and was greeted with skepticism by seasoned Bundy watchers. Dobson honed in on the pornography detail because that was his shtick. He was trying to have a war on pornography. He'd been part of a task force that he had helped get engineered through the federal government. Uh, and he wanted to use Ted Bundy as the poster child of why pornography is bad. In his 10 years on death row, Bundy had gained a reputation for being a cunning and manipulative interviewee. Dobson was entering the lion's den. With nothing to lose, this final taped interview seemed like the perfect opportunity to really find out what made Bundy the killer tick. First of all, you, as I understand it, were raised in what you considered to have been a healthy home. Absolutely. You were not physically abused, you were not sexually abused, you were not emotionally abused. No, no way. I, and that's... Part of the tragedy of this whole situation is because uh, I grew up in a wonderful home with two dedicated and loving parents and one of uh, five brothers and sisters. In the clip, Ted talks about his childhood being loving and Christian, but at the time of his execution, a defense psychologist uh, came up with, with a lot of material that suggested otherwise. It's hard to imagine the childhood Bundy described to Dobson producing a brutal serial killer. 
but he failed to mention something specific about his early years that others believe haunted him throughout his life. The question of Ted's illegitimacy uh, has been sort of the, the, the topic A in all the efforts to try to figure out what was really going on inside his head, and I think it preoccupied him as well. What he'd neglected to mention was his birth in November 1946 in a home for unwed mothers in Burlington, Vermont. His mother, Louise Cowell, had gone there from Philadelphia to have Ted. She later told the story that Ted's father was a World War II veteran who had romanced her and compromised her and then abandoned her. In the course of our investigation, we interviewed a lot of people, including some of his family. One member of his family, I believe his aunt, uh, told us that there, was, there had been suspicion that in fact his grandfather was also his father. Uh, but uh, you know, we were, we were not able to uh, prove that that was uh, the case. To avoid the shame and stigma of illegitimacy, Bundy's mother passed him off as a baby brother. Later, she moved to Tacoma, Washington, where she met and married Ted's stepfather. How nuts would you be if you were pretending to be a, a brother when you know it's your mother? He told me that he discovered it by going through his parents' papers and that it came, he said it came as a bit of a, a revelation to him. Now, I spoke with a boy that was a very close friend of Ted's uh, and I asked him to, if he had ever discussed the illegitimacy question with, with him and he said yes, and the sense this fellow had was that Ted was deeply angry about it, that he was very hurt by it and he was upset by it. And when he tried to sort of say, well, Ted, you know, your, Johnny loves you, you don't worry about this sort of thing. And he said, Ted's answer was, you're not the one who's illegitimate. The young Bundy also appeared to be acutely conscious of his family's lack of money. I remember him talking to me about how he was so mortified that his family drove uh, these sensible, ugly ramblers, uh, the model of automobile, and that his family didn't have a lot of money, and, he, and how he was jealous and resentful of kids in school who had more things than he did. And it's a, it's a very early sign that Ted has this sort of narcissistic fixation on things and, and on possessions. And of course, possessions becomes a very key word later on in his life. As Bundy was growing up in the 50s, America was discovering sex. Back then, Hugh Hefner had just published Playboy, which, though tame by today's standards, provoked moral outrage. In this climate, Bundy claimed to Dobson he made a discovery that was at the very root of his motivation to kill. As young boys do, we explored the the back roads and sideways and byways of our neighborhood and oftentimes people would dump the garbage and whatever they were cleaning out of their house and from time to time we'd come across so, pornographic books of a harder nature than uh, more uh, graphic you might say more explicit nature than we would encounter let's say in your local grocery store and this also included such things as let's say detective magazines and uh, more hard those that involve violence and yes Ted tells uh, Reverend Dobson that when he was a young boy that he found pornography, as he called it, outside the house. Um, it's things he saw in grocery stores and things he found rummaging through people's garbage, which he said was a little bit more uh, hardcore than what he was, was available in the grocery stores. Well, I grew up in exactly the same town as Ted and went into the same kinds of grocery stores that he went into, and there wasn't anything like that on the store's shelves in those days. Playboy had barely been invented. You know, at the time, I thought he was talking about, well, the, the magazine du jour, Playboy, and some others, but uh, he told me the ones that, that he found most interesting and compelling were the detective magazines. With their lurid depictions of women in peril, it was violence, not sex, that became the real moral panic of the 50s. The EC comics were extremely graphic to a point that there was always some form of female terrorization. Erotic terror, I guess, is what you would call it. It unlocked the zipper of an awful lot of minds of children and eventually teenagers until they were banned. 
those magazines typically had bondage as the theme of their of their covers. It would be a woman with a hand, with handcuffs, or, or she'd be gagged, or something like that, and she would be threatened, uh, on, you know, mortally threatened on the cover of this magazine, perhaps with some some weapon or something. Bullets ripping through people, limbs being hacked off, blood splattering, but constant terror in the look of these beautiful women in lingerie. I'm willing to bet that they started to ignite what became a forest fire in Bundy's psyche. This, Ted Bundy told me, was the real pornography that motivated him. It was this demonic, as he classified it, demonic presence of a, a, a chemistry of sex and euphoria and control and murder. For Bundy, this was a cocktail with a lethal effect. It fueled your fantasies, didn't it? Well, in, in the beginning, it fuels this kind of thought process. Then, it, it, at a certain time, it's instrumental in what I would say crystallizing it, making it, make it into something which is almost an, like a separate entity inside. When Ted talks on the tape about the entity inside him and, and how uh, his, his word is pornography fueled this entity, he certainly never in our conversation said that what the entity was, was, was uh, interested in was fueled by pornography. He said, I used the word entity in talking to people because I felt that that's what they wanted to hear, that they could accept that, that they would have extreme difficulty in me just saying, I decided to kill three weeks from now, and I've psychologically put it on my calendar, and it was going to happen. Um, he thought that people had difficulty in comprehending that, so he said, I used the word entity or ulterior forces or something like that. It's not uncommon for other serial killers to do that. I've, I've had the opportunity to interview many. The key issue here is that Ted was on this course to behave the way he behaved with or without pornography. Gradually, Bundy started turning his fantasies into a disturbing reality. One night, he gets drunk, and he's had quite a bit to drink, and he's walking down a street, and he sees a woman walk out of a bar, and not even thinking, he follows her, and he follows her to her house, and as she's trying to get in the door, he runs up behind her, and she screams, and he runs away. Again, he's out one night prowling around again he's had something to drink again he sees a woman this time he grabs a stick and comes up behind her and hits her on the head and then again shocked at what he's done runs away he gets into peeping which is one way of of getting what he wants working on you know building his fantasies peeping in the window masturbating peeping in the window masturbating and then one day he just jumped over the line and went nuts on January the 4th, 1974, Bundy crossed the line. 18-year-old Joni Lenz was attacked in her bed. She was found barely breathing, covered in blood, and with a metal bed frame rammed into her vagina. Incredibly, she survived. Others would not be so lucky. By July 1974, the whereabouts of six missing girls around the Northwest remained a mystery. Bundy had become a calculating killer. Each time I'd harm someone, each time I'd kill someone, there'd be an enormous amount, uh, uh, especially at first, an uh, enormous amount of, of, of horror, guilt, remorse afterwards. But then that impulse to do it again would come back even stronger. Now, believe me, I didn't. It, it, the unique thing about how this worked, Dr. Dobson, is that I still felt in my regular life, the full range of, of guilt and, and uh, remorse about other things, uh, regret and... Uh, but you had this compartmentalized... This compartmentalized, uh, very well-focused, uh, 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 very sharply focused area where I, it was like a black hole. It was like a, you know, like a crack. And everything that fell into that crack just disappeared. I mean, he shocked me at times because he could be so remote uh, from the crimes that he committed. He had so depersonalized these victims. He started laughing at one point when he was talking about uh, 
Roberta Parks. Uh, I just started laughing about her. We learned of the importance and the capability of these killers being able to compartmentalize things so that they can carry out s normal lives otherwise, where they're not going to be suspicious. And when anybody finds out that they are a suspect, they're totally shocked that they've got this capability to do that. Ted did not have any guilt. He did not have any uh, remorse. He did not have a conscience. And so when he talks about being, you know, 99% normal and 1% abnormal, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's an ugly joke. He was 100% abnormal. Bundy's seemingly normal life continued. Whilst abducting and murdering young women, he was able to hold down an apparently normal relationship with Liz, a young divorcee. She later testified, though, to an increasingly strange and violent sex life. Liz reported a lot of, you know, unusual behavior. Ted examining her body with a with a flashlight at one point. Um, him wanting to tie her up. Uh, she, I think, she found some pantyhose in his, you know, among his, his clothes at one point. Uh, she once found a a, a big uh, bag or or box of, of keys to all sorts. Of, she had no idea where all these keys were from, but they probably came from Ted's nocturnal uh, wanderings. She would remember later on him telling her that he had thought about killing her at one point. Um, she rem would remember to the police that he tied her up on a couple of occasions so they had bondage sex. Bundy started to enjoy the power he had over his victims. He and I talked about why he killed. He said because possession was at the bottom of his desires. He wanted to possess them and he said as if he would possess a Porsche or a potted plant. And a memorable quote from Ted that, uh, to an FBI agent um, was, you know, if you have enough time, you can do anything you want to them. In the detective magazines, it seemed Bundy had found the perfect inspiration for his crimes. He reconstructed those magazine covers. Uh, some of the victims were found with their hair styled in different ways than they normally would, or different clothing or different makeup on. He often, after striking and rendering the girl unconscious, um, would molest them and, and strangle them simultaneously. Um, and he enjoyed that quite a bit. Bundy's killings continued across the Midwest until his luck ran out, and he was arrested over a failed abduction in Utah. Police raided his apartment, but what they found there and at later locations wasn't exactly hardcore. When we searched his apartment, we didn't really find uh, uh, pornography as such, but what we did come up with in his possession were junior majorette magazines. Uh, that's, of course, the young, young girls uh, in their majorette uniforms. I think that was his form of pornography more than anything. It was just seeing these vulnerable little girls. Bundy was sentenced to 15 years for the kidnapping, but remarkably, he escaped and was soon on the run and headed for his most barbaric killing spree yet. This was a vicious animal who was foaming at the mouth when he was inside that house. To the waiting crowds outside Florida State Prison, one of America's most prolific serial killers had become a demon in human form. If anybody deserves a burn, he deserves a burn. He uh, penetrated one of them with a, with a branch. Uh, he had bite marks on buttocks. You took all your horror movies and put them together and got one personality out of them. Uh, there he is. To the public, Bundy's murders defied belief. But Bundy himself offered a clear analysis of what had led him to kill. We're talking about an influence which, that is the influence of violent types of media and, and violent pornography which had an, was, was an indispensable link in the chain of behavior, the, the chain of events that led to the behaviors, to the, to the assaults, to the murders, and what, and what have you. Bundy's calm appearance and apparently rational analysis belied a state of mind capable of carrying out a final, terrible killing spree. He was on the run and a changed personality. Taking a room at a boarding house just minutes away from a university campus, Bundy was surrounded by young women. When he got to Florida, he felt that he was regressing. As he said, um, I, I started to deteriorate. 
he reverted once again to burglaries, being a peeping Tom, uh, all of those things that he started doing prior to him becoming a murderer. And then he recognized full well that he had gone into what he called his barbaric state. The killer struck first at the Chi Omega sorority house. He clubbed and then strangled to death 20-year-old Lisa Levy and 21-year-old Margaret Bowman. At least one of them was raped. The killer came in from the night and then returned to it with an ease that has so far baffled police and left most co-eds here terrified. So when Bundy left the Chi Omega house, he took off down this street and then turned down this corner here. He traveled maybe three blocks. And I imagine he was pretty much in a frenzy. The frenzied attacks at the sorority house marked a dramatic change in Bundy's deteriorating mental state. There would be one final victim. In the interview with Dobson, even Bundy himself appeared remorseful and unable to explain this last killing. One of the, the final uh, murders that you committed, of course, uh, was apparently little Kimberly Leach, 12 years of age. Uh, I think the, the public outcry is greater there because an innocent child was taken from a, from a playground. What did you feel after that? What was there? Were there the normal emotions three days later? Where were you, Ted? I... Uh, I can't really talk about that right now. That's... Police at the time of Bundy's arrest recall him being anything but remorseful. When we showed him the picture of Kimberly Leach, the 11-year-old girl that he uh, tragically took the life of, uh, he threw the picture down and said, what you don't understand is I am the cold-blooded son of a bitch you'll ever meet. He was trying to show us that it didn't bother him. The manhunt to find the killer ended when Bundy was arrested in a small town on the Florida coast. At the time of his capture, his mental state shocked police. Well, when we got to him in Pensacola, he was, he was off the chain, as the kids say nowadays. And uh, we spent three or four days trying to reel him back into the reality of what's going on. Uh, he spent the nights uh, talking to the police about uh, himself in the third person. Uh, and he, uh, in effect, confessed to having committed uh, a number of murders. The killer that had left a trail of bodies across America had come out of the shadows, but he wasn't going down without a fight. What do we have here, Ken? Let's see. You always say an indictment, all right? Why don't you read it to me? Mr. You're on for election, aren't you? Mr. This Bundy? You got it, didn't you? Mr. Bundy? You told, me that you told him that you were going to get me. He said he was going to get me, okay? You've got the indictment. It's all you're going to get. Protesting his innocence, he was going to lead his own defense. The public would have to prepare themselves for a new Bundy. Ted, the showman. Bundy's trials were among the first to be televised, and his notoriety turned them into a media circus. The ego, narcissism and outright arrogance of the serial killer were on open display and created a figure of grotesque fascination. I, I, think, the, I think the people in Florida, uh, both the public and the prosecutors uh, in the case, and the judges probably also, uh, uh, were fascinated by the uh, enormity of what they thought he had done. And, and the fact that you know, he, was, he could have been the person next door. Uh, somebody described him as, uh, you know, kind of uh, a lot of uh, common people's uh, ideal of kind of person they would like their daughter to marry. Uh, and so I think that there's something frightening about the prospect that, you know, this all-American looking guy could be a serial killer. Bundy became a cult figure. Women flocked to his trial. Every time he turns around, I kind of get that feeling, no, no, you know, going to get me next. Yeah. But you're, yet you're fascinated by him. Very, very. Every night when I go to bed, I just, you know, it gets 
very scared. I shut my door and locked him. And, uh, try to imagine yourself in his place and to see how he's feeling, looking at the pillows, the blood stains, and everything. And if he really did it or not. Why do you do it? I don't know. <laughs> Robin Lloyd, Channel 4 News. Ted had his gallery of women um, nearly every day in court, and they would send him messages. Uh, they would try to get his attention. They would try to catch his eye. And then later when he was on death row, he got tons of mail from them. They would send him nude pictures of themselves, uh, you know, erotic stories, their, their fantasies of being with him. Um, it's a very bizarre syndrome, and I, 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 I frankly had a loss to explain it. You're going to represent yourself, or you're going to get another attorney? I'm staying with the man I know best right now, and that's me. Um, his ego led him to believe that there wasn't a brighter attorney out there, even though he had never finished law school. The extraordinary part about the Bundy trial was the extent of his participation in it. Bundy appeared every inch the lawyer, cross-examining witnesses, analyzing blood samples, even questioning forensic evidence of bite marks taken from a victim's bottom. Our contention all along, Your Honor, has been that they have taken my teeth and twisted them every which way but loose to fit. He swaggered across the courtroom when he does all the gestures, puts his hands down, and, I mean, he watched enough courtroom and enough Perry Mason on television that he absolutely looked and sounded the part of a lawyer. And it was just amazing to believe that this was the guy that was accused of all these brutal crimes. Good morning, officer. Good morning. Just as he had separated his murders from his everyday life, in court, Bundy separated the serial killer from the lawyer. Though the jurors felt differently. Um, he was apparently thinking he was coming across as a lawyer and they were seeing him in a much different light. He never really uh, appreciated the, the weight of the, of the accusations that he carried with him and the effect that that had on ordinary people. The first victim you saw was Kathy Clark. Bundy appeared to relish the role of lawyer. At one stage, launching into such an excruciatingly detailed cross-examination that he appeared to be reliving the crime. One after another, his trials were descending into chaos. It went day and night on his whim. He got to the point of auditioning some of the lawyers for who would make the opening statement, who would cross-examine certain witnesses, who would make the closing argument? To lawyers trying to conduct a, an overall strategy of a trial, this was impossible to deal with. You couldn't have a theory of defense when the client was constantly pulling the rug out from under you. In a final act of farce, Bundy used a legal quirk of Florida law, the fact that his girlfriend was under oath, to conduct a brief but legal marriage ceremony. Sure. you want to marry me? Here again is the difference in Ted as a defendant who doesn't see the significance of what he's doing to the jury, and Ted, the supposed lawyer in the case. I guess to Ted, it, it felt or made it seem that he was humanizing himself. But it looked like a trick. To me, it looked like a trick. Maybe he didn't care how it would look to a jury. Wedding or no wedding, the jury was in no doubt. Therefore, it is the sentence of this court as to count one of the indictment that you, Theodore Robert Bundy, be adjudicated guilty of murder in the first degree, and that you be sentenced to death for the murder of Kimberly Diane Beach. In the 10 years that Bundy spent on death row, books and films vied to explain what had motivated the seductive serial killer. Well, Ted Bundy was uh, a, a gruesome celebrity in, in this country, and uh, especially in Florida because of the murders he committed here. And at the time, he probably uh, could easily have, uh, have been called and was considered the most hated man in America. As his appeals ran out, a demonized Bundy began thinking about how he would be remembered. You know, I make no bones about it. I am looking for an opportunity to tell the story as best I can in a way that makes sense to me and the way that will help 
not just you or the families, but that's very important, but also to help my own family. You see, I saw the look in my stepson's eyes yesterday, and to see the look in his eyes uh, confirmed my worst fears. See, he said, could you, he was, he was just absolutely astounded. He couldn't understand. He was writing me questions, just furiously writing questions. I could see that, you know, that he was, you know, how really bewildered he was. And I need to give him a chance to know, and others a chance to know what was really going on, what it was really like for me. He wanted to create a legacy for himself that was something other than murder. Uh, he wanted people to see that there was another side of him uh, and that this other Ted uh, had done things that were uh, uh, socially valuable uh, and that were redemptive in some way. The interview with James Dobson gave Bundy a unique opportunity to offer himself up as a stark warning to society, framing his crimes against the backdrop of a young boy fatally corrupted by pornography. Those of us who are, who have been so much influenced by violence in the media, in particular pornographic violence, are not some kinds of inherent monsters. We are your sons and we are your husbands. And we grew up in regular families. And pornography can reach out and snatch a kid out of any house today. It, it snatched me out of my home, it snatched me out of my home 20 30 years ago. Towards the end of the interview, Ted sort of begins to catch on to what Dobson wants him to say, and you, you notice that he, he issues these dark warnings about all the other, you know, the, the other minds out there that are being you know, polluted by what they see on cable TV. And, and what he's arguing is, is that the, the individual responsibility you know, to, to be a citizen, to not be sociopathic, to actually be empathetic and have and have a, a conscience um, is is can be undermined by dirty pictures and it simply is not true well I believe Bundy was used as a weapon by the right-wing uh, conservative lib very religioso uh, might even call him religious mafia who decided to use him because he perpetrated sex crimes and the minute the word sex rears its empty head you can blame it all on the adult entertainment industry so Bundy becomes their banner. He becomes their bloody flag to wave into the face of all these people who, because they're watching adult material, might become future Bundys. What a crock of shit. Porn as a, a source of inspiration and, or pushing these guys along, as, as, as Ted tried to say, is you have to be very careful about that because one man's pornography is another man's bore. And the stuff that Ted read would not interest in another separate offender because he had a whole separate group of fantasies that he's feeding. Plus, pornography is not necessarily uh, sexual violence that you might find prepackaged in, in, a, in a magazine or a, a, in a video. When you really examine the psychology of the aberrant offender and where they go to look for things that interest them and help ratify their, their, their needs and all that, um, it's not necessarily what you would think. When Ted was arrested, for instance, he had a bunch of cheerleader magazines in his car. And this was deep, deep, deep into his psychopathology. It's at the end of it, when he was still looking at magazines that 12-year-old girls get in the mail. Guilty and awaiting execution, the true scale of Bundy's atrocities became apparent. He was confessing to a murder on a tape recorder as he walked down the hall to the electric chair. He learned that his appeal had been turned down about midnight. I understand he received a call from his attorney, Paul Nelson. Prison officials are now preparing to shave his head and prepare him for execution at 7 o'clock. The execution of Ted Bundy couldn't come fast enough for a crowd that was beginning to feel like a lynch mob. 
folks. I think it was clearly the circus atmosphere that developed here this morning. Somebody today compared it to a public hanging in the Old West. Hundreds of people, maybe thousands, showed up, almost boiling over with glee that Ted Bundy was finally going to be executed. Bundy's final interview was headline news, and Dobson eagerly fed it to the waiting media. Uh, he wanted to make a statement to the world about uh, pornography, both softcore pornography and hardcore pornography. There was a great deal of remorse. Uh, he wept several times while uh, talking to me. He did say to Bundy's me, life had ended with an extraordinary meeting of two separate agendas, and it was impossible to tell who was using who. That last night uh, before he died, uh, we shared communion. He ministered the communion. The communion elements were a flat Coke and a piece of stale bread. And uh, it was the most uh, significant communion service I've ever attended. I learned through God's love that I could love the unlovable. Bundy was suspected of having killed 30 women, but by the time police and FBI finished questioning him, that figure was closer to 100. Even in his final moments, he confessed to yet more killings. He, he was confessing to a murder on a tape recorder as he walked down the hall to the electric chair. I knocked her unconscious. drove her into 10 yards into the small grove of trees that was there. Somewhere around 6.20 or 6.30, the lights in the prison went off, and that's the sign when they switched to the generator. At, at some point, they brought Ted in, and he was being supported by the guards, by the guards sort of walked in. And his knees just buckled. I mean, the, the guards had to hold him up, and then he sort of got his composure back a little bit right after that, and he sat down. They then began to prepare him for the execution, strapping him in. And he looked at everybody in the room, one by one, going went through everybody's eyes, trying to see who we knew or who we remembered. And the only person he smiled at was the prosecutor, and it was kind of, hi. And then they uh, put the headgear on, put the mask over his face, and executed him. Uh, and you see the body tense up like that, and then it's sort of, loosens up and then after a little while it'll tense up again when they hit him with the second jolt of electricity uh, there is a smell of burning flesh in the room uh, and just a light wisp of smoke from the leg as I recall he's gone he's gone he's gone yeah he's gone Bundy the monster was gone. Florida had waited 10 years for its revenge. In the days after his death, one question went to the heart of Bundy's killings. Ted, what would your life have been like without that influence? You can only speculate. Yeah. Well, I, I know it would have far better not just for me and and it's, uh, excuse me for being so self-centered here it would have been a lot better for me and lots of other people I know that lots of other innocent people victims and families it would have been a lot better there's no question but that it would have been a, a, a fuller life uh, certainly a, a life that would not have involved I'm absolutely certain would not have involved involved this kind of violence that I have been, that I have committed. He starts out by saying, pornography didn't make me do it. But by the end of the interview, he's, he's basically agreeing with Dobson. Dobson is kind of prompting him all the way through it. I mean, Ted is fairly honest early on. He says, you know, I, you know I'm not going to, you know, I, it's my responsibility. You know, I, I take all, full responsibility for everything that I've done. And, you know, pornography was part of it, but it didn't make me do it. But by the end of the interview, um, there, there's sort of a cheering section for the anti-pornography forces. And, and with that, you know, that, you know, that if, it, if it weren't, 
In fact, Ted does specifically say that if pornography had not come into his life, he would not have become a killer at the, at the end of the interview. And that simply is not true. And, and, it, and Ted knows or knew that that was not true, but he was willing to say it to, uh, to please the Rev. The interview uh, should have been an alarm bell for the country. Uh, it should have been a, uh, a wake-up call for parents. Uh, it certainly motivated me. I launched into a vigorous anti-pornography campaign as the state attorney and uh, lost my next election because of it. I think Ted had a lot of things going on in that interview. He wanted somehow to look a little bit better in everybody's eyes. He was probably talking to his mom. He was probably, you know, he was, he was so careful saying, you know, you know my, my, my mother loved me and she protected me and all this sort of thing. It was, it was Bundy trying, trying to, to put his spin on, on, on his career. I asked him about pornography a couple of times. And uh, for some people, it's a disease, humiliation control kind of disease. Other people, it's just fun. But uh, I asked him about it, and he said, why would I need pornography when I have the real thing? And then from what he's done during some of his uh, alleged murders, he did have the real thing. I've heard some people say that he obviously had some brain damage as a young child. Others will say, it's an inherited bad gene. Others would say it was a psychological scars from his youth. Others would say he read pornography. Um, and I discussed these things with him and, and his feeling was all of these factors may have entered into my life somehow without me even knowing it. However, you know, I planned the crimes. I understood what I was doing. And regardless of what label anyone would choose to pin on me, I'm responsible. I'm not proud of it. I wish it didn't happen, but it was my decision.